Okay, lecture 10, digital baseband communication. So, last week we spoke about digitization, we spoke about the Nyquist criteria for sampling, and we spoke about quantization, we spoke about quantization error, we spoke about aliasing and anti-aliasing filters, we spoke about the relationship between the number of levels and the number of bits, and we quantified that in a number of um, simple formulas. We spoke about the bit rate, but what we didn't speak about was how the digital data would actually be transmitted. Today, that's what we're going to be looking at. So, where are we now? We are now two lectures from the end of the module. Okay, so we have exactly two more lectures to go. Those lectures will take place after Easter. So, lecture 11 will take place on the Monday, on the 20th of April, and the final lecture, multiplexing, will take place on the Thursday. 23rd of April and the following Thursday will be our class test. I call it a class test but it'll be an online home test if you like and this um, test is a timed test. It starts at nine o'clock UK time. Okay by then the clocks will have gone back or forward in the UK and they may not do the same in your time zone so make sure you know what time nine o'clock is in your time zone because the test starts at nine o'clock sharp. Okay, if you don't think you'll be available at that time, if you're traveling, if you're in quarantine, if you don't have access to the internet, if your time zone makes it inconvenient for you, if you're ill or otherwise unable to take the test, if you know that in advance, please let me know. Let me know if you know in advance that you can't take the test with everyone else and I'll try to make an alternative arrangement. If you only find out on the day, again, let me know as soon as you do find out and we'll make some other arrangements. But taking the test is to your advantage, okay? Because what we have is two class tests and an exam. The exam has been replaced by something else. So the two things that we know, we know about are the two class tests. I can tell you about the exam later, but the class test is your chance to do something that you're familiar with, because the exam will be something you're less familiar with and you're less comfortable with most likely. So taking the test will be to your benefit. So try to, try to take that test, try to improve your mark. Whatever you did in class test one, try to improve that for class test two, okay? The average for class test one was uh, just over 70%, and I don't see why we can't get an even better average for class test two because the material for the second part of the module is actually easier than the material for the first part of the module. Okay, moving on. This is a little bit of information about the class test. Nothing has changed from last time we spoke about the class test except that I've removed the one hour limit. So last time I said it was a one hour test. Um, it's not going to be one hour in duration. I haven't decided how long it will be. It'll be timed, but it won't be one hour because it's unfair to put you under time pressure when access to vital might not be um, guaranteed. Okay, can everybody still hear me and see me? So now we have our digital data. Now we have, so after the digitization, after the sampling and quantization, we have digital data. How are we going to send that data? How is it going to be transmitted? Is it going to be in the form of um, digital pulses sent down a cable? That's the group of photographs on the left, where we have a, a, a physical medium, a cable. These are the, the cables buried under the ocean, cables under the ground, the cables running between um, your computer and your router, between your printer and your computer. So th this is band pass modulation. Okay, we don't generally call it baseband modulation because there generally isn't a carrier when we're dealing with a, um, with a, um, with a cable or a physical medium. I'm just trying to get um, a pointer because my mouse pointer has disappeared. So, okay, so um, the group of photographs on the right, those represent the um, 
band pass modulation, so wireless communication, radio communication. That will be our final or our, our next lecture. That's the lecture on the 20th of April. Lecture 11 will be talking about digital wireless. At the moment, we're talking about digital wired or cable or baseband communication. Okay. So no mod even though we use the word modulation, it's modulation between inverted commas because there is no carrier. So we'll be covering three things today, pulse modulation and pulse code modulation, and they're two separate things. We'll be talking about line coding very, very briefly, and we'll be introducing something called the Harley-Shannon or the Shannon-Harley law, which is um, relating to channel capacity. That tells us how fast we're allowed to communicate. So you're familiar with this... Um, diagram here where we have our data that's initially um, if it's analog it's sampled then quantized and then encoded but then that needs to be transmitted so everything else so the pulse modulation that green box on the right that's what we'll be looking at today so when we talk about pulse modulation we're talking about baseband communication and again even though we call it modulation there is no carrier so what we normally mean by modulation doesn't apply here. So pulse modulation schemes. Now this applies to analog and digital data, at least the first three illustrations, the first three graphs apply to analog and digital data, but I'm discussing it in the context of digital data. So today's lecture is digital band pass modulation, uh, baseband modulation. So we're looking at digital modulation. So remember we had an analog um, wave and it was sampled. Now that sampled wave, we can use that to modulate the amplitude of a pulse and that becomes, pump, becomes pulse amplitude modulation. And if it's after digitization, it becomes a pulse with a finite amplitude or an amplitude from a finite set of amplitudes. So that becomes a digital pulse. So what we're doing is we're changing the amplitude of the pulse depending on the amplitude of the sample. So we call that pulse amplitude modulation, PAM. But we don't have to do that. Instead of changing the amplitude of the pulse, we can change the width of the pulse. So we call that pulse, pulse width modulation, where the pulse becomes um, fatter or thinner, depending on the value of the digital uh, output, so the output of the quantizer. For a large value, it would be fat, like you can see there, and it would be skinny, a thin pulse for your small values. Okay. PPM is pulse position modulation, where the pulse has a finite amplitude and, sorry, a fixed amplitude and a fixed width, but that pulse is then shifted the position of the pulse is shifted according to the amplitude or according to the value of the digital output. So we can change the amplitude of the pulse, the width of the pulse, or the position of the pulse. The pulse amplitude modulation, pulse um, width modulation, and pulse position modulation. Okay, text wall is running, so if you, if you, if you, if you don't chat, put, put your message on chat, you're welcome to text as well. Um, let me just check. Okay, that final uh, illustration at the bottom, that's called pulse code modulation. So in pulse code modulation, what's happening? Instead of having one pulse, you can see there are five pulses. So what's going on there? Why have we got five pulses? So initially we have variation in amplitude, then we have a pulse variation in width, pulse width modulation. PDM just means pulse density modulation and PPM changes the position. Then pulse code modulation, we have a, uh, a fixed amplitude and a fixed width, but we have a different number of pulses. So we have five pulses in this case. So five pulses to represent five bits. So if your data is zero, 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 0001, you'd have um, zero, 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 0001 represented as a pulse. So you have uh, no pulse, no pulse, no pulse, no pulse, then a pulse. 
the next sample here is 0, 1, 1, 1, or 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, that would be no pulse, 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 etc. So we were actually encoding the data using binary digits. So you can see that pulse amplitude modulation, pulse width modulation, and pulse position modulation are very different from pulse code modulation. One difference is that they could be analog or digital. The other difference is that we're actually changing the shape, position, or um, amplitude of a pulse in relation to the digital input, whereas with pulse code modulation, we're actually encoding the data into these pulses. Most of what we're going to talk about today is going to be PCM, pulse code modulation. Now, um, Zoom is warning me that we have eight more minutes. So in eight minutes, the lecture is going to shut off. You're going to have to go back and click the second link that I sent you. I sent you two links, two invitations. And if you go to Vital, there's an announcement with two links. You'll need to follow the second link to rejoin the lecture. Okay, so we're going to break in eight minutes and then resume. So, how is PCM generated? Well, we have an analog signal that's first sampled at a sampling rate fs, and then it quantized using n bits per sample, and then encoded into a series of ones and zeros. The data rate, and you will have seen this from the problem sheets, from the 15 questions that we put up, and from the slides at the end of last lecture, the data rate that we're generating is the product of the sample rate and the bit depth. So n multiplied by fs, that tells you how many bits we're generating per second. Okay, quick question. If we have 16 levels, how many bits per sample do we need? Okay, you really have no excuse for not getting this right. Okay, so the link is again, polev.com stroke elec. So for 16 levels, how many bits do we need? Four bits, because two to the power of four is 16. Well done. So where are we now? This is a PCM system. What have we got? We've got an analog signal to start with that goes through a low-pass filter. Why does it go through a low-pass filter? To band limit it, to make sure that we have a finite band bandwidth so that we uh, don't risk aliasing. Then it's sampled at sample rate, then it's digitized using a quantizer, then it's encoded into bits, and then it's transmitted as um, uh, pulses onto our digital channel. Then we have these repeaters. Remember in the video that I showed you, those repeaters were those huge, um, they, they call it missile-shaped um, devices. Those, those huge things that were thin on both ends and thick in the middle, those regenerative repeaters. What they do is they repeat the signal. They, refresh the signal and recreate it, regenerate it. I'll show you that in a second. But we have several of those along the channel. Then we have a regeneration circuit, a decoder, reconstruction filter, and then you have your destination where your analog message is received. Now, the regeneration is to um, recover the signal because of the, the the different effects of the channel. So you remember we have interference, noise, attenuation, distortion, and we have all of these affecting the quality of our signal. So our signal might, you can imagine it as a crisp square wave with pulses of ones and zeros when they were originally transmitted. But after they've traveled several miles down the cable, tens of miles, hundreds of miles, the signal will then be attenuated. It will be affected by the bandwidth limitation of the channel. And your signal may not look the way it looked originally. And it becomes harder then to recover the ones from the zeros. So what we have is a, a retransmission, a regeneration, where the signal is sampled, thresholded, and then recreated. So at each of these sampling points, we determine whether or not that signal was zero or one, and then we recreate a fresh pulse. We don't take the original pulse and process it. No, we recreate a fresh set of pulses. So it's called regeneration. We're not removing the noise. We're not removing the distortion. We're not filtering it. 
we're regenerating the digital data. So it's as if all the damage didn't happen. We're retransmitting it. And then a few miles down the, down the line, we still have another repeater and another and another. But nevertheless, there, is, there are still errors. What we try to do is to reduce the errors as far as possible. But sometimes errors are inevitable, unavoidable. So, very little maths in this lecture, but this is some of the things you need to know. So at a sample rate of FS with N bits per sample, you multiply the two, you get FS times N. That's the number of bits per second. L is just the number of levels. So L is two to the power N and N is log L to the base two. Now, it, this, we, there's something called optimal pulse shaping. And that's designing a pulse that's able to transmit two bits per second per hertz. If we do that, then we're able to have a bandwidth, a PCM bandwidth equal to half of that bit rate. So if you have 10 bits, your bit rate, bit depth is 10, and your sample rate is 100, 10 times 100 is 1,000, you can still have a PCM bandwidth of one half of 1,000. Okay, so that's the optimum, that's the best possible PCM bandwidth. You're not able to get a bandwidth of less than the product of n times fs. In general, the bandwidth will be n times fs. It won't be half n times fs, but half n times fs, that's the best bandwidth we can achieve. Deep Sand is saying in PCM, the time between each code is the same, yes. So we're sampling at a sample rate of fs, so the time between adjacent um, samples is one over fs, that's constant. And the time between adjacent bits is one over nfs because there's n bits per sample. Okay, so we've got less than three minutes to go, so um, I might be cut out without warning. So quick question for you in these final three minutes. A signal is sampled at 10 kilohertz using PCM, how many bits per second? Really easy question for you. How many bits per second? So remember, we have a bit depth of 10. So a bit depth of, in this case, it'll be log 16, which is four. And we have a sample rate of 10,000. So you've got your 10,000 and you've got your four. You don't look at the 16. 16 is the number of levels. What you want is the number of bits, which is log 16. So it's four multiplied by 10,000. Okay, correct. So that's 40,000, well done. Next, another quick question for you in our final minute before we cut out. If I have 16 levels, does that require half the bandwidth of 32 levels? Yes or no? If I have 16 levels, that's four bits, does that require half the bandwidth of 32 levels, which is five bits? So what you should be thinking, what you should be thinking is five bits and four bits. Is four bits going to require half the bandwidth of five bits? Remember the bandwidth is proportional to two things, the sample rate and the bit depth. And I'm saying the sample rate is constant. So think about the bit depth. The bit depth isn't 16, it's four and five in the two cases. So four is not half of five. So Will I require half the bandwidth for 16 levels? No, I'll require four fifths of the bandwidth. So the bandwidth times four over four. So line coding is the second part of uh, today's lecture. So line coding, that's the process of converting the digital data into digital pulses. So we spoke about sampling, we spoke about quantization and together that creates your digitization. We spoke about encoding. We spoke about the different kinds of um, pulse modulation, pulse amplitude modulation, pulse width modulation or pulse density modulation, pulse position modulation, and then pulse code modulation. We, we looked at a few questions that involve pulse code modulation.
but line coding is the process of actually taking this data and converting it into digital pulses. Now we are talking about pulse code modulation. It's how do we take the series of ones and zeros and convert them into pulses? What kind of pulses are we going to use? What shape will these pulses take? Okay, um, Shu is saying, I didn't cover the second question. Um, that um, comes as a little bit of a surprise. Let's go back. This second question here, I'm assuming you're talking about this. So we spoke about PCM and we said, the PCM bandwidth depends on two things, sample rate, and the bit depth, so N and FS. And we're told in the question that the sample rate isn't changing. So the only thing that's changing is the bit depth. The bit depth for 17 levels, how many bits do we need for 17 levels? 17 levels, you'd need five bits. Four bits will give you 16 levels. Anything more than 16, anything more than 16, you would require um, an additional bit. So PCM with 17 levels will require five bits. Almost exactly the same as the previous question. So in the previous question, we had 16 and 32. Now we have 16 and 17. 17 levels requires an extra bit. So you can't have a fraction of a bit when we're talking about um, PCM. If we're going to encode it into a finite number of bits, it's either got to be four or it's got to be five. Anything between four and five isn't allowed for this kind of question. So we're going to need five bits for the 17 levels. So Deep Sand is saying with five, you will have unused levels, right? Unused bits, yeah can have unused bits, yeah. So it's, it's really wasteful to have 17 levels because you might as well have 32 levels. But yes, you'll have unused bits. Well, not unused bits, unused levels, yes. Yeah. So 17 levels, you will require five bits. 16 levels, you'll require four bits. Will five bits require twice the bandwidth of four bits? No, you'll have a ratio of five over four. So the ratio, will be five over four. Okay, my mouse pointer keeps disappearing. I don't know why that is. Okay. I'm just trying to get my mouse pointer back. Okay, can you all see me? Okay, I'm still trying to get this to be shared. Let me try stopping the share and sharing again. Okay, so I hope you can all see. So now we're going to talk about line coding. That is, how do we actually generate those pulses for PCM? And there's a number of different line coding formats and each of these has its own um, its own uh, properties, okay? So 
We're not going to go into this in too much detail. I just want to point out that you have something called non-return to zero and return to zero pulses. And we have unipolar and bipolar signaling. Okay, so let's separate the two first. So a non-return to zero signal remains constant for the duration of the bit. So it's either zero for the duration of the bit or it's one for the duration of the bit. It doesn't change during the bit period. So it's either constantly one or constantly zero. It doesn't change during the duration of the bit. So that's non-return to zero. Unipolar just means that it's either zero or positive. It only has a single pole. It's not positive and negative. It's either zero or positive. Now, non-return to zero uh, signaling that isn't unipolar, so polar or bipolar, will have two poles. It will either be negative or positive. So for a zero, it will be negative. For a one, it will be positive. So imagine, imagine non-return to zero signaling is like if you had a torch, a flashlight, and you turned it on for a one, you turn it off for a zero. So zero, one, one, zero would be off, on, on, off. Or actually, it would remain on. So it would be off, on, on, off. It wouldn't turn off between these adjacent ones. So between the first one and the second one, it would remain on. Now, a polar non-return to zero, you wouldn't have off, on, you would have, it's difficult to explain with a light, but imagine it with two lights. It would be zero, one, one, zero. So it would be negative, positive, positive, negative. Now for a return to zero pulse, or return to zero line coding, for zero, it doesn't matter. This is for unipolar. For zero, it's just zero, nothing there. But for a one, you would turn it on for some part of the pulse period, and then it would be off again. So it returns to zero within the pulse duration. So it's one, but not for the entire pulse duration. It then returns to zero. Then the next one, it's one for a part of the pulse duration, and then it returns to zero. Throughout the zero, it doesn't change. It remains zero. And then for the one, turns to zero. So if you look at this, the pulses are narrower than they would be for the unipolar. So that's one difference we've noticed. Another difference we've noticed is that for unipolar, we have a DC value. The average value, the DC value is positive. Whereas for um, the bipolar, for the polar, we have a DC value, which is probably close to zero if we have a, a symmetric distribution of ones and zeros. Now, a bipolar return to zero is exactly the same as the polar return to zero, except look what we have here. We have for a one, you have a one, but you extend it for the entire duration. Oops. And then your following one, one, your following one, you change from being positive to negative. That allows your pulse to be twice as wide. And for zero, it remains always zero. So you can tell that these are two adjacent pulses, one followed by a one. Whereas in the unipolar non-return to zero, you couldn't easily tell that these are two ones rather than one one, because it's just constantly on. So without timing information, you're unable to tell how many ones you have. Whereas here, it, timing information is contained within these um, within these uh, amplitude transitions. Now, differential encoding and split phase Manchester encoding are again similar. I want you to look into this, look into how these are generated. What I want you to notice is that for non-return to zero schemes, where the pulse width is constant for the duration of the um, bit, we have two bits per level change. So if you go back, 
look at this non-return to zero, for every level change, you can encode two bits of information. Whereas for a return to zero scheme, such as here where you return to zero, you can only encode one bit for every level change. So we have a different bandwidth efficiency. The number of bits that we can squeeze into every hertz of bandwidth is different. It's twice for the non-return to zero scheme compared to the return to zero scheme. I know this isn't immediately obvious. You need to think about it. It will take some time. One way to think about it is simply to look at the non-return to zero and the return to zero. Which one has a narrower pulse? The return to zero by necessity will have to have a narrower pulse. That means a wider frequency. So if you think of it as a return to zero having a wider frequency, it means it'll have less bandwidth efficiency. It requires twice the bandwidth of a non-return to zero scheme. That's why we have this bandwidth efficiency. It tells us how many bits per second we can cram into every hertz of bandwidth. So when we want high bandwidth efficiency, we would want to use non-return to zero schemes. This is similar to the equations you've seen before, but now a little bit more detail. So a binary PCM system using L quantization levels. We've already said that number of bits per sample is log L. But this time, this time rather than, um, okay, so log L. L isn't necessarily a power of two. So L could be 8, 16, 32, 256, 1024. But as you saw in that um, example, in that question, L could be 17. It could be 25. It doesn't have to be an integer power of 2. In that case, if L isn't an integer power of 2, we need to take log of L. But you see this square bracket here? So this square bracket that has a top but doesn't have a bottom, that's called the ceiling function. The ceiling function means the next highest integer. So if you took log um, 2 of 17, so log 2 of 17 is 4.1. 4.1 is bigger than 4. So four bits are not enough. We need five bits. That five, that's called the ceiling function of 4.1. You're taking the next highest integer, not the closest integer, the next highest integer. So remember we said the uh, number of bits per second is the sample rate multiplied by the number of bits, so n times fs. fs is one over t, which is the bit period, sorry, the sample period. So now we have log L divided by T. Now bandwidth efficiency, we said, is the number of bits per second divided by the bandwidth. So for non-return to zero, we have two bits per second per hertz. From this, you can find the minimum bandwidth of um, PCM. That looks like it's a new formula. It isn't, we've seen that before. Where have we seen that before? If I take you back to there, the minimum bandwidth with fs times n divided by 2. All I've done is I've replaced this n with log l. So it's actually exactly the same. The t, 1 over t is just fs. So I've just rewritten the formula in terms of different symbols. Instead of using fs and n, now it's log l and um, uh, t. Oh, there's a little mistake there. Let me just fix that for you. Um, that obviously should be L. That's not N. So N is log two of L. So I'll fix that in the PowerPoint. Okay. Can you all still see me and hear me?
Okay, so this is the final part of today's lecture. We want to determine how fast we can send data down a channel. Okay, so that isn't determined by the speed of light and it's not determined by the speed of the um, uh, propagation of the pulse down the medium. It's determined so that there is something which will pre prevent us from sending data as fast as we would like to send it. Okay, so we, we, we touched on this in one of the very, very early lectures. We said signal to noise ratio and bandwidth will affect how fast we can transmit data. But I want you just to think about it again. If you have a complex communication system with multiple links, then the data rate is limited by the slowest link in the communication system. That's called the bottleneck. So the bottleneck determines how fast you can transmit data. So the slowest link will determine how fast you can communicate. So let's say you have a really fast um, computer and a really fast server, but your internet connection at some point is very slow. So let's say the, 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 connection, the connection between your computer and the router at home was very slow, or the connection between your router and the uh, local exchange down the road was really slow. That will throttle your internet connection. That will bring down the connection speed. It doesn't matter how fast your processor is. It doesn't matter how fast your Wi-Fi network in, in your house is. It doesn't matter how fast your internet provider is providing the data. As long as there is a link in the system that has a lower speed or a lower data rate, we're going to call it channel capacity in a minute, that's going to bring down the speed of your communication because in order for communication to be error free we need all parts of the communication system to operate at that lowest speed so your slowest link that will affect that that will be your bottleneck and that will determine your channel capacity but when we talk about channel capacity we talk about the, that link we're talking about what determines the rate of that link and it turns out that there are three things that determine that link or that determine that speed. Those three things are the bandwidth of your channel, the signal power, and the noise power. So you, you should already have a feeling that the wider the bandwidth, the faster the communication. You can send more bits per second if you have a wider bandwidth channel. But we didn't explain clearly why signal power and noise power affect your channel capacity. So this is something called the Harley-Shannon law. Sometimes it's called the Shannon-Harley law because it's these two people who together came up with this um, relationship. And they said the um, theoretical limit on how fast you could send information down a channel in bits per second is related to the bandwidth of the channel and the ratio of the signal power to the noise power. So this is signal to noise ratio, but not in decibels. This is a unitless signal power divided by noise power. So let's take a, an example of this. So we've almost finished a few more slides and our lecture will be finished. So what bandwidth is needed to transmit 2.3 megabits per second on a channel with a signal to noise ratio of 70 decibels? Okay, so this isn't S over N, this is SNR, signal to noise ratio of 70 decibels. So we need, first of all, before using the Shannon Harley law, we need to convert the 70 decibels into a ratio. So remember, we said that SNR is 10 log S over N. So we have S over N. would be 10 to the power seven, so 10 million. So the signal is 10 million times the power of the noise. So S over N is 10 million. So before we use the shannon Harley law, make sure you don't put decibels in there. What goes in there is the actual SNR, so not the 70 decibels. It's 10 to the power 70 over 10 or 10 to the power seven. Okay, so 10 million, the one becomes very insignificant here. So it's, um, 2.3 megabits, just use times 10 to the power six for the purposes of this module. So it's 2.3 times 10 to the power six, 
times log to the base two of 10 million, never mind the one, that one isn't gonna make a difference, and you end up with a bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. So you need 100 kilohertz in order to transmit your 2.3 megabits per second, error free. If you don't have the 100 kilohertz, either you have errors or you need to reduce your bit rate. Okay, so now for the first time, we're linking the three things, signal to noise ratio, channel bandwidth, and how fast we can actually transmit, which is the bit rate. Another example, here we have a television picture. You know how many pixels there are, how many dots? You know how many uh, brightness levels we have, how many frames per second? That means how many pictures per second? So I'm not gonna go through the, the answer here with you. That's the answer there, it's three megahertz. But in answering this, this time, in finding the number of bits, we don't take the ceiling function. So we don't say, well, eight brightness levels means four bits. No, we can say eight, so 10 brightness levels means log two of 10, which is 3.2. So we can use 3.2 bits for this kind of question where we're talking about the, uh, the channel capacity. The reason is, the reason this is different from the PCM examples is here we're looking at the theoretical, we're looking at the theoretical upper limit. So in theory, even if we were to use 3.2 bits per sample, we would be able to transmit this error free at the channel capacity. You're probably thinking, what's 3.2 bits? There's no such thing as 3.2 bits. How can you have 3.2 bits? It's either three bits or four bits. Now that's true, you can't have 3.2 bits. For a PCM system, you need to make up your mind. Is it three bits or is it four bits? But in theory, if we wanted to, we could have some non-PCM system where we have three bits for some, um, uh, for some amplitudes and four bits for other amplitudes, maybe two bits for other amplitudes, where on average, we would have a, um, uh, we, have, we would have 3.2 bits per sample on average. Okay, so for this kind of question, we don't take the ceiling function. We just take log to the base two of the number of levels. Okay, another example for you here. Again, the 12, you take log 12 to the base two. You don't need to take the ceiling function. Again, the answer is there. You can go through this on your own. Fax machines, ancient devices. Many of you will never even have seen one of these, but it's an interesting example to, to use to illustrate the uh, channel capacity. Okay, so in summary, what we've done is today looked at pulse modulation. So that's pulse amplitude modulation, pulse width modulation, pulse position modulation, very briefly. We looked at pulse code modulation in a bit more detail. We looked at the bandwidth requirements of pulse code modulation. We spoke of bandwidth efficiency. We spoke about line coding and different line coding formats very briefly. And we spoke about channel capacity and how that's related to bandwidth and signal to noise ratio. After Easter, lecture 11, we'll talk about band pass modulation. That's modulation where we actually have a carrier rather than um, baseband modulation, which is what we had today. So that's a summary of where we are. So le next lecture will be our penultimate lecture, the lecture before last, and then the following Thursday, we'll have our final lecture. Then the Thursday after that, we'll have our class test, our home test on the 30th of April. Make sure you have that in your diary. There'll be more warnings and announcements about that, but the class test is on the 30th of April. There will be practice tests. I've already released two practice tests for lectures seven, eight, and nine. Very soon I'll release a, a third practice test for lecture 10, and there'll be two more practice tests to prepare you for the home test. So hopefully you'll have plenty of problems, examples, and uh, questions for you before the beginning of the test. So finally, wherever you are, I don't need to tell you this, but just 
stay at home and stay safe. Hopefully we will um, uh, meet again face to face next semester. Now I'm going to um, uh, end the recording and end the lecture, but I'll remain online if anybody has any questions um, to ask about this or about anything else about this module. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture. I'm going to end the recording now.